Yeah, so I'll give a little bit of background on the group. So as most of you know, Young Professionals Group for the Society started, I think it was early this year, or maybe late last year. And so really what it's intended to do is target the dem demographic of like college through probably the mid thirties and try to bring that group together for um, topics that would be of common interest. Anybody else is welcome as well. Just the topics would be geared a little bit more towards people within that age range, such as this one. And so I'm glad everybody could join today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I can give a little introduction about myself. So my name is Julie Cohen. I'm a genetic counselor at the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, my, I, my, I specialize in neurologic disorders, neuromuscular disorders, um, neurogenetics and developmental disabilities. Um, one of my areas of expertise is in muscle disorders. It's um, how I got my start at Kennedy Krieger. I've been there my whole career for over 14 years now. Um, and I work in the Center for Genetic Muscle Disorders where I provide clinical genetic counseling. Um, and so when I first started there, I couldn't even pronounce FSHD. It took me a bit, it took me a minute to learn how to say it, but it's uh, FSHD is near and dear to my heart because um, it, we see so many um, patients and families, um, individuals of all ages with this condition. Um, and so I'm happy to, to be here to, to talk with you guys. And I was um, tasked with um, covering some topics like um, uh, genetic, the genetic aspects, the inheritance, family planning, and reproductive options. Um, I did pull a couple slides together just as background, it's somewhere I could start, but really, especially for small groups like this, which I really love speaking to small groups, um, I want this to be really discussion-based and, um, and Q&A, not me giving a lecture here. So that's about me. If anybody on the, um, on the Zoom wants to share if they have particular questions or things they want me to cover, you can pop that in there. Um, or to get us started, I think I'm glad I did put some slides together. I know I told Zach this afternoon, I don't have any slides, but I found them. So does anybody want to start off by, by asking questions or having a, an objective for our conversation tonight afternoon? Yeah, I assume this is probably what your slides kind of focuses yeah. on, but going through like the key options, considerations. Yeah, all right. I'll start there, kind of giving an, an overview and can get into more detail as needed. Okay, so this is, I've been I always have, like, this is, I don't get nervous about speaking in front of groups, small or thousands of people, but I get nervous about sharing my screen and my slides. So I need to focus for a minute to make sure I'm going to do it right. Okay, so I'm going to share that screen. I'm going to share, and then I need to make it big. And you guys can see the big size screen now. Yes? Aha, yeah, cool. I did it. Okay, super. So this is me. This is what I'm talking about. So as a genetic counselor, um, so genetic counselor, so I have, I'm not a doctor. People call me doctor. Don't call me doctor. Call me Julie. Um, specialized training in clinical genetics and counseling. And my role is to work together with um, physicians to help understand the cause of an individual's health or developmental problem. And I do a lot with an interpreting genetic testing, with talking about um, hereditary conditions, how it's inherited. And these are the sort of questions that in my muscle clinic and when I'm working with individuals with FSHD, the questions that I get asked. So what caused my FSHD? Why do I have it? Help me understand the genetics. Why did this happen to me? What are the chances that my children or my future children or other relatives of mine could have FSHD? Um, am I able to have children without FSHD? What do those options look like? Do I need to have genetic testing? And what in the world do my genetic test results mean? So I can um, cover any or all of these questions tonight and potentially others. Um, I, oh, as an aside, so if you have questions or want to talk about, you all can just unmute yourself and interrupt me, or you can put in the chat, but I am not looking at the chat. So Zach, you'll just have to um, interject and let me know. Okay, so super briefly, just so we're on the same page, um, FSHD, it is one of the most complex genetic um, conditions that I've worked with over my career, but it's to break it down super, super simply, in case you aren't already aware, most people have FSHD type 1, which is caused by a deletion in a specific region on chromosome 4, where there's a segment of DNA um, that 
somebody decided to call it D4Z4. I have no clue what that stands for, but there are these little repeats that are repeated a bunch of times and it's normal. The problem in FSHD type one is there's not enough of those repeats. We call that a deletion. Um, and uh, that ultimately leads to expression of a gene called DUX4 that's not supposed to be turned on um, after uh, embryonic development. And FSH type one is inherited in a dominant pattern. Um, type two FSHD, um, there's no deletion, um, but there's a mutation or a pathogenic variant in a gene on a different chromosome that results in a hypomethylation of this region and expression of DUX4. And this inheritance pattern is more complicated. It's called diegetic inheritance. Probably most people that, because FSHD1 is um, the most common, when I'm talking about inheritance patterns and dominant inheritance, I'm going to focus on that. But if anybody has specific questions about the type 2 inheritance, I can try to tackle those. So what is dominant inheritance? Um, so for a person with FSHD in um, each pregnancy they conceive, there's a 50% chance that the child would inherit the copy of chromosome four with the deletion, um, who would uh, expect it to, be, to develop or at risk to develop symptoms with FSHD, and a 50% chance of passing on the normal copy of chromosome four and not having FSHD. And there isn't any differences in those chances, um, depending on the gender or the sex of the parent or the offspring, so it's same for males and females. Um, many people with FSHD have a parent who is also affected, so they inherited the condition from their parents, but maybe about 30% of individuals have, um, did not inherit it from their parents. Um, the deletion occurred new in them due to a spontaneous change either in the egg or the sperm or very early in embryonic development. The fancy word for that is de novo, um, but uh, that still for that individual, it's a 50-50 chance of passing it on in each um, conception. Um, now, a tricky thing with FSHD is predicting what would the level of symptoms be um, and what would be the age of onset. And some folks may really have mild or no symptoms their whole life. Um, and um, scientists, researchers, uh, doctors, we're still trying to figure out um, how we can predict that, but the genetic test result itself doesn't predict it very well because we see a range even in individuals in the same family. So the, for an individual with FSHD who's thinking about having a family, um, there are a range of options. Um, the first option is not doing anything uh, as part of getting pregnant or during pregnancy. So just going about it the, the old fashioned way um, and then down the road, the child or adult could choose to be tested. Um, there's options to get pregnant the old fashioned way and test um, the baby or the fetus once pregnancy has already begun. And I will explain a little bit more about this option, as well as the kind of the most high tech option, which is in vitro fertilization, IVF with pre-implantation genetic testing. And then there's um, alternatives um, that are some folks forget about, but are really good options as well, um, using donor, egg, sperm, or embryos, adopting, or choosing not to have children. And this isn't a, um, like, this isn't a mathematical decision. Like, it's not that this is one correct answer, this is the only choice for you, or if this is your situation, you should do that. It's so personal and unique to each individual and each couple. Um, uh, and there's benefits and limitations um, of each of these. So getting a little bit more into, I get, I'd say I get the most questions about P, PGT. So PGT is genetic testing of embryos created through IVF in vitro fertilization. Um, and shown here in this picture, it's absolutely wild that this is possible, but this is showing an embryo. Um, and um, before an embryo is transferred to the woman's womb or uterus to start a pregnancy, there are some cells from each embryo that can be taken off and tested um, to see if they have that genetic, um, genetic marker. So this allows a selection of unaffected embryos to use for pregnancy. Um, so in a little bit more detail, um, how PGT works. So it starts off in like the typical way for IVF, which is, um, so the process would be um, the woman, so both man and woman um, have evaluations and blood work to see what is their fertility level, are there any other concerns going on? 
they should meet with a genetic counselor. Once the IVF process is started, what that looks like is um, medications that the woman takes to stimulate her body to produce many eggs. We call that ovarian stimulation. Um, and that's um, usually injections and some oral medications, and that they are followed very closely by a, um, a, a fertility center with lots of ultrasounds and blood work. Um, then at, uh, there's a certain point where there's the egg retrieval. It's a minor outpatient surgery where those eggs or oocytes are retrieved. Um, and then the male partner provides a sperm sample. And then under the microscope, each little, sper each little egg and a little spermie are put together and fertilized. And those embryos are allowed to develop in culture in the, in the lab for a few days. So in typical IVF, after about five or six days, um, they would choose one or two of the best looking or healthiest appearing embryos um, and use that and transfer to the woman to start a pregnancy. When you're doing PGT uh, for a genetic condition at the five or six day stage, um, the embryos are biopsied and a few cells are removed from each embryo. And incredibly, it doesn't damage the embryo. Um, so those embryos are then flash frozen, which also doesn't damage them, and the cells are sent off to a very specialized genetic testing laboratory. Um, and um, I'll go into some caveats on the next slide, but uh, it, in that genetic testing, it determines is that embryo predicted to have the genetic condition or not. And then once the it's identified which, if any of the embryos are predicted to be unaffected, then in a subsequent cycle, um, the woman uh, receives more medications to prepare her body, and, and one or two embryos is thawed. Again, also doesn't damage the embryo and transferred to the woman, and everybody crosses their fingers, and um, in a few weeks, they'll find out if it stuck or not. Um, so that is a slightly more detailed but still oversimplified um, overview of the IVF and PGT process. So with FSHD um, and other genetic conditions, um, it is a little bit, um, well, in particular with FSHD, it's a little bit trickier because PGT for FSHD is performed using linkage rather than direct testing for the deletion. Um, if anybody wants, I can try, I can explain it in more detail, but the takeaway here, what the implication of this is that PGT is generally not possible for individuals with de novo deletion. Um, with this linkage testing, basically instead of, they're not testing the, the cells from the embryo to see do they have the deletion or not. They're testing to see which copy of the chromosome um, does, does that, did that embryo have. And they, um, linkage is a process where they test for certain markers, benign markers that we'll just call ABC. So we have capital ABC, lowercase abc, and you can see that it's the capital ABCs that are all on the chromosome with the deletion or associated with a chromosome with the deletion, and the lowercase abcs are with the normal chromosome. So in the embryo, they'd be testing um, for the ABC, is it capital or lowercase, as opposed to um, the deletion itself. But in order to figure out which markers are on the deletion chromosome or not, you need samples from more than one affected individual. So the, the individual themselves who wants to do PGT and a parent, for example, or an affected sibling. So in the case of de novo deletion, um, it's typically not possible for PGT. And I have had so many conversations with couples where that's really disappointing for them because they were really hoping to use this option. One question on that. So to be specific, yeah. it sounded like two individuals are needed to do the Yes. Test. Two individuals from, so like the person with FSHD, like you, Zach, and um, if you, one of your parents was affected, um, or sometimes they, it may be possible to establish linkage with, like, if you ha had a sibling who's affected, or maybe you've already had one child um, who is affected or not, and you want to have it, a, a subsequent child. And then, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, different topic, but same subject um let's say somebody's got like two things that they have going on that they might want to get tested for yeah it might be like from the different parents can that be yeah uh, mm -hmm. yeah so in theory you can test for most genetic things um with pgt um so it is 
po it's possible to to test for for more than one genetic condition. You have to know what you're looking for. So sometimes I'll get questions like, "Well, why can't they just test the embryo or test the fetus for everything?" That's not possible. But if you know what you're looking for, yes, um, there could be more than one genetic condition that they check for in the embryo. Um, it um, you know it reduces the it. I guess I would say the numbers go down, right? So if you have 10 embryos and you're only testing for one thing, and maybe you'll get five embryos that don't have FSHD, if you're putting another condition, if there's another condition of concern, there may be fewer embryos that are clear of both. Um, these are the, these are all really good questions. And before anybody is considering, or if anybody is considering PGT, I always recommend to have a consultation with a genetic counselor who specializes in reproductive technologies and prenatal testing. Um, and I actually refer my patients, like I'll have these initial conversations. And when a couple says to me, yeah, we think we want to do this, Julia, I say, all right, great. You need to go talk to this person because there's a lot of like um, nuances with it. Um, and each, each situation is also unique. Um, and there may be some kind of family structures where they are able to um, to figure out a way to do PTT. And then, so a few questions about one, um, so key person to speak to genetic counselor, who mm -hmm. else would be involved if somebody were to go through a process like this? The, uh, just to make sure I understand, the question is what other sort of um, medical yeah. specialists would be involved? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, a reproductive endocrinologist, so that's a doctor who does like get, it helps with fertility. So doing IVF or other assisted um, fertility. Um, uh, so those would be the two main specialists. So um, I recommend that couples um, have a consultation with a fertility center that offers IVF with PGT. Um, not all places um, may offer PGT. So I should also say there's a couple different types of PGT. If you're doing PGT for a um, a specific genetic condition like FSHD, that's called PGTM. We have so many acronyms in genetics. Um, there's also PGT that can be done just for screening for, say, chromosome disorders because chromosome abnormalities are common in early embryos. So that's a different type of PGT. So what you'd be looking for is a fertility center that um, that can do PGTM. Um, usually, the uh, the fertility center itself is not doing the genetic testing of the embryos. They send those cells to um, a very specialized genetic testing lab that um, designs these custom tests. They're called probes, um, and uh, it's individualized for each um, for each situation. Uh, and not all fertility centers have a genetic counselor as part of their practice. Um, I think it's uh, so if the fertility center does not have a genetic counselor as part of their practice, um, the, in my experience, I've seen that the companies that do the, the genetic testing for PGT have genetic counselors and maybe there's like a video consultation. Um, when possible, I recommend that couples meet with a prenatal genetic counselor, even if they're not part of their fertility practice. And because also that way, the prenatal genetic counselor can talk about all the options because um, there are other options. Um, can talk about is there any other appropriate genetic screening or testing to be offered to a couple, um, and also can help with that decision making, right? About weighing what's what's best for me and for my partner. Um, and PGT is not always um, not always the way to go. So. Yeah, Anna, you had one. I have a question from the chat, but it does take a bit of a, a left turn from this particular uh, line of questioning. So, Zach, yeah. if you had a follow-up question, we'll start with that first. Yeah, I was going to say this linkage-based testing. I assume that's yeah. relatively reliable. Yeah. Uh, so that's another good question. So, how accurate is PGT? So, PGT is never a hundred percent accurate, and it, this is not just specific to FSHD. It's any genetic condition. Because actually, most of them. Um, a lot of them, others are done by linkage as well, because there's a small um, there's a small chance for error because of something. I didn't actually put this slide in, but there is a small chance 
for error. I'll just leave it at that and without trying to explain the technicalities. Um, I think mo these are the good, the essential questions to ask a prenatal genetic counselor or the fertility center you're considering using for PGTM is what do they say is their accuracy rate? Usually it's like 95%, somewhere in that ballpark, 90 to 95%. So it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. Um, and it is typically recommended um, to, uh, for, for couples to be, definitely for couples to be aware of this um, and they um, to consider testing during the pregnancy as well, um, because that's going to give you the closest to 100% accurate there is. And testing during the pregnancy, I can talk about that in a little bit. I want to get all questions, but that's um, a minimally invasive procedure that can be done um, in the end of the first um, or mid second trimester. And then you mentioned like sometimes you're gonna have to go through multiple like cycles of this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's kind of the median or for somebody with in this context with oh like the median number of cycles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and actually it's that depends more on the um the the fertility status and age of particularly the woman, but also the fertility status of both couples. So generally speaking, younger women produce more eggs. Um, and as women get older, um, we produced fewer eggs or those eggs are um, more likely to have other random chromosome problems. So, um, um, so it's, yeah, so, and that's something that when you, uh, when you as an individual or a couple goes to a reproductive endocrinologist for the consultation, they'll, that's why a lot of this blood work is done. So to check what's the different hormone levels um, um, and based on that and a person's age and their reproductive history, the doctor will be able to say kind of what, give more specific statistics. But I, I don't think, I'm not aware of an across the board statistic, but it may take, um, it may take a couple of cycles. It just really varies. And I mean, sometimes you produce 30 eggs in an IVF cycle. Sometimes it's a lot less than that. So, so it's a long process to go to and that to go through. And that is an important factor that individuals and couples consider is, do I want to go through a multi-month process? Because even for one like cycle of IVF with the PGT testing, it's probably three months from like initial consultation to transferring an embryo. Um, uh, and so I, yeah, so it's not a small undertaking. And you're gonna switch to the question you had? Um, actually, I have a couple of quick questions. Um, yeah. uh, well, at least, oh, I, now I have more. Oh, there are a couple. All right, I, I love it. I hate, <laughs> I hate talking at people. I want questions. Oh, I want it to okay, be great. conversational. Okay, so I'll I'll sort of like I think I'll 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 just start. Um, yeah. Um, maybe with I'll PGT. Stop sharing my screen for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Relating to PGT specifically. Yes. Do most major insurances cover this, or is it something that's often out of pocket? Mm -hmm. Another really big factor is the financial aspect. Um, insurance coverage for PGT varies widely. Um, and there are some insurance companies that do cover it and cover a lot of it. Um, there are some that do not. Um, there are some states that mandate IDF coverage um, and others that do not, or there's exceptions to that. Um, I've also encountered the it, it, it just incredibly frustrating situation where an insurance company will cover the PGT because a person has a genetic condition, but they won't cover the IDF piece if they're not infertile. And it's just, like I've written letters to insurance companies about this, it's just frustrating. So um, insurance coverage varies widely. I do tell couple, like I, I'll speak to couples, they say, well, I'm sure I can't afford it. It's like, well, you don't know. Maybe your insurance covers it. Maybe they cover a part of it. Um, uh, fertility centers know that insurance coverage is a challenge. And so they um, may be able to work with you with a payment plan. Um, you can just like you can finance a car or a house, you can finance IVF. Um, there's uh, a website I have at the end, but it's an easy website. It's called resolve.org. It's a fertility or infertility fertility support organization nationally, and they have um, great stuff on their website. They have um, sections about um, 
IDF and PGT. They have an amazing section all about adoption, about all, all other alternatives. So, um, and they have financial resources as well. Uh, but paying out of pocket, it's tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have another question that came up in the chat. And yeah. um, this question is, uh, could you please discuss some of the potential risks with carrying and delivering for someone with FSHD? Mm -hmm. And can you speak to whether it's common um, for symptoms to worsen postpartum? Yes. Thank you for asking this question because women with FSHD, they... Um, you have, there's additional considerations um, uh, because uh, the, the caveat is I'm not a doctor and I'm also not your doctor. So you got to talk to your doctor, but generally speaking, um, women with muscular dystrophy, including FSHD, when, when they're pregnant, um, sometimes the weakness gets worse and it may not get better. Um, uh, this is a, that's a very broad question, but any woman with FSHD considering a pregnancy should speak with your neuromuscular doctor. Many women with FSHD have healthy, wonderful pregnancies, but women need to be aware of that possibility. Um, what are the chances that's gonna happen? Uh, I don't have numbers there. It probably relates um, to some extent to the baseline level or the starting level of weakness. Um, uh, women with FSHD, um, I don't know that they would necessarily be need to follow be followed by a high risk of obstetrician or a maternal fetal medicine specialist. That may also depend on um, whether there is significant weakness, um, mobility status. So these are all really important questions to discuss with your doctor um, prior to um, to getting pregnant. But not to be deterred, though. Um, that's another kind of general comment I want to make is that. I've also spoken to a couple um, and individuals who have either been told directly or implied or just gotten the vibe that doctors and medical pro professionals think they shouldn't have kids at all, or if they do, they have to do some sort of a prenatal test or PGT because it would be wrong to pass this on. And those are just not true. You, you, you can have children if you want them and the way you want them um, and all choices are are equally acceptable. Anecdotally, from what I've heard from folks who, you know, work with the society, I have heard plenty of women say that particularly in postpartum, um, they've experienced some sort of decline, but I've never heard anyone say they regretted it. So <laughs> right. True. Right. Yes. Yeah. And I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Yeah. It can be also hard to tease out like what is um, would have happened anyway versus because of carrying a pregnancy. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, Anna, do you have any more from the chat? Uh, not right now. Okay. I was going to say, so like a key topic for people that are like a de novo case is mm -hmm. they can't do that. Are there any other alternatives that weren't on that initial list? For mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So let's go there. Okay. So back to my, I think I did it. Look at that one click without hesitation. I did it right. Okay. Whew. So um, what are some alternatives to, uh, to PGT? So there's prenatal testing. This is testing, um, genetic testing during a pregnancy to determine if the fetus is affected. Um, and there are two procedures that can be done to obtain tissue or cells from the pregnancy for DNA testing. Um, the um, a person doesn't need to have both of these procedures. It's one or the other. And the Big difference is timing-wise. So um, a procedure called chorionic villus sampling or CVS, this is done at about 11 to 13 week gestation. So at the end of the first trimester. And this involves, it's all under done under ultrasound guidance. It looks way worse than it actually is, but a little catheter is inserted through the cervix or sometimes it's through the abdomen, depending on the position of the placenta. Because what they're doing here is taking a little bit of the placenta tissue called the chorionic villi because the cells that develop to become um, the placenta, these are the same, or so it all derived, the cells became the placenta and some became the baby. And so it's usually the, the same genetic makeup. Um, and then the other procedure called amniocentesis or amnio, that's done a little bit later in the second trimester. And this is a needle through the abdomen to take some of the fluid because in the fluid is um, amniocytes or baby skin cells, basically. So in either, in both of these, procedures, the 
um, samples are obtained from the um, from the fetus or the pregnancy, and DNA testing is done. And with prenatal testing, you can do direct testing, meaning they're looking for the deletion. Um, so this is going to be highly as accurate as you can get um, um, to know did the baby inherit the um, the deletion or the normal copy. Um, uh, now we can't predict. So a baby that inherited the deletion is predicted is will have FSHD or is at risk to develop symptoms of FSHD, but it's not possible to say what is the age of onset, what is would the how mild or severe um, would the condition be? Because there's other factors that influence that, and we haven't figured out what all those factors are yet. Um, so these are highly accurate procedures. Um, there is a small risk of miscarriage, about a half a percent or one in 200, probably less than that, maybe more like one in 400. So it's a small risk of miscarriage. The big downside of these procedures, though, is that a person's already, a woman's already pregnant. Um, so um, uh, the, the option would be to end the pregnancy if you learn that the baby is affected. Um, that's a really personal decision. And for some couples, um, it, they may not, it just may not even be an option for them themselves, or they may, you know, kind of struggle with that decision. So, um, but I, um, I, there's no judgment coming from, from here. And I want to relay that this is also a very acceptable option um, if a couple feels this is right for them, even though it's not right for everybody. So then let's not forget about some other really good um, options that couples can consider um, using donors. So um, a woman with FSHD may choose to use eggs donated um, from, from an egg donor uh, who does not have FSHD, and that could be used for IVF. Um, a man with FSHD could uh, choose to use um, uh, to, to utilize a uh, donor sperm from a donor who does not have FSHD, and that can be used either for IVF or a slightly less high-tech, actually a lot less high-tech um, procedure called intrauterine insemination, where the um, sperm is injected directly into the woman's uterus at a time when her body is ready, has an egg ready and waiting. Um, and then um, there's also uh, ability to receive a donated embryo from a couple who does not, um, who neither one has FSHD. So these are um, good options to consider if it's really important for the couple, like maybe for, for the woman to carry a pregnancy herself um, and or for couples, at least for the first two options, where they want some genetic connection. They say, well, I want my baby to be genetically related to at least one um, of the parents. Or the woman says, I really want the experience of carrying a pregnancy. Um, the downside to these are that one or both parents is not going to be genetically related to the child. Now, there's a lot more than DNA. Actually, I would say DNA is a teeny part of what makes someone a parent, speaking as a mother of two boys who are sleeping upstairs right now, hopefully sleeping, probably not sleeping. Um, there's a lot more that goes into um, having a family and being a parent than that DNA connection. But, you know, again, for some couples, that's, it's important to have at least some um, genetic con connection there. Um, so those are donor options. And then the option of adoption. We all know what this is. Um, uh, we may not know how to go about adopting a baby and what's involved in that. So this, I, I love this website on the Resolve site um, that talks about different types of adoption, um, things to consider, um, what costs look like, what benefits, drawbacks are if you're doing domestic or international. Um, so this is another really good option for couples who want to be parents. Um, and um, yeah, so that's my spiel about the different, those different reproductive options. That's kind of the end of the slides I have prepared, but I, um, I, I hope, uh, I, yeah, I'm sure there are more questions, so holler at me. So that's a pretty comprehensive list of options. Um, yeah. Obviously a lot of scientific fields, there's a lot of kind of breakthroughs going on. Do you expect any additional options to become available in the future? Yeah, yeah. So. What is coming down the pike? So I really hope, and I'm not the only one, that um, PGT um, that will get better ways to be able to do PGT for individuals with uh, with non-inherited conditions, like with with for de novo instances. Um, 
so that would be that would open up that door or that option for a lot of couples. I really uh, I, I this is not specific to FSHD, but there's a lots and lots of advocacy of trying to get um, insure better um, uh, insurance coverage for these technologies. Um, there is so I don't I think it's not. Uh, there's some like not I don't know if people have heard about like non-invasive prenatal testing or the like the blood test that women can have in the first trimester that people use it just to find out the sex of their baby so they can have a gender reveal party. Um, that I I don't know that there's anything on the horizon for testing FSA like testing for FSHD that way. Um, but that doesn't really obviate the um, the concern about like you're already pregnant finding that out. Um, but there's so many, so much on the pipeline for treatments for FSHD. So I think the outlook there is just like super, super exciting. Um, so, you know, couples who are making, or an individual, I say couples, but also individuals who are making decisions about having children and how to have children, um, it's, it's, you know, talking about a condition like FSHD, which um, is, is a different different than if we're if it's a um, you know much more like severe condition that can affect babies that's highly fatal and where there's really no no hope for treatment. So I talk to couples who feel like you know what I I think that by the time my child is old enough that they would develop symptoms I think that there's going to be something more for treatment and the doctors say yeah I think so too and so. Um, increasingly, I've, I've seen that couples are, you know, kind of foregoing um, using any of these technologies and just letting it to chance, and um, uh, and there's going to be more there. So I think that's also that I don't I don't know. I'm sure you all can Anna can speak more about specific research efforts, but that's what I would also see um, coming down is that just better treatments for individuals who are born with um, the deletion. That's such a hopeful note. I'm so excited to hear that because, yeah. you know, working in the field and we're, we're entrenched in it all the time. Um, you know, I feel very hopeful that there will be a treatment um, of some kind available, you know, really right over the horizon. Um, but it's hard to convey that, you know, and so, yeah. and for people who have lived with it for years or decades, right. um, where there is no available treatment that you can get, yeah. go to CVS and get over the counter. Like that's, that's okay. a, frustrating situation to be in. So I'm just so glad to hear that people are also feeling hopeful because yeah. I am. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I know that I, the doctors I work with, um, try to convey that, you know, you know, in a balanced way, right. Not overselling mm -hmm. like, oh, in five years, there's going to be a cure, but that research has come a long way. And it makes me feel old to say that, well, 14 years ago when I started, but like when I started, they, they were, doing this, I mean, they didn't even know what caused FSHD2. They didn't, like, the the whole haplotype thing wasn't really, nobody really knew about that. Like, I remember seeing these papers come out and be like, oh, my gosh, we figured this out. We figured this out. And um, so it's, I, I've i seen it over, over my career, um, which is shorter than a lot of the doctors that I work with who've been seeing it for much longer. So, yes, I am um, I am hopeful and I, uh, and I hope that others can feel hopeful as well um, without minimizing the experience of living with, with FSHD and with also without minimizing, you know, there's so, it, it, it's, it's so nuanced. And I think it, it's more than just about like the, can be just about like the medical aspects to it. Like it affects, it kind of, I don't, I'm, I don't need to tell you guys this, but Sometimes when I talk to doctors, I'm like, tell me, I need to talk to you about this, right? That that's why kind of how I started with that it's not, um, there's no right or wrong answer um, that is so personalized to what an individual's experience living with the condition has been, um, their tolerance for certainty or uncertainty. Um, and now I'm just rambling. But yes, takeaway is that um, I am I am hopeful. And I think you all should be as well. And the FSA Society is just doing an awesome job. Um, I have a, a tangential question that came up in yeah. the chat um, that I'd love to hear your, your take on. Yeah. Um, are there any clinical trials or treatments specifically for 
minors, children under 18, um, or is it just going to be for adults? I don't, I'm not the right person to answer that question. I think generally the try, like when they're developing these new drugs, they start trying them in adults, like if it's a, uh, before they, they try it on the kids, but I, I'm not a good, you probably, Anna, you might know more than me. Um, I'll take a crack at answering that question, actually. Yeah. yeah. So at the moment, um, there are three clinical trials that are happening right now. All of them are testing drugs on patients between 18 and 65. So at the moment, all of the clinical trials that are going on um, and the ones we know that are coming up in the next six to eight months uh, will be for adults. I would also impress upon this group that there is a massive movement right now um, to include um, pediatric studies and, um, you know, and pediatric treatment options, both from the industry side, but also from the um, academic and research side. So even, you know, every year we hold a research conference and there was a whole section of the conference, you know, a quarter of the conference was dedicated to pediatric care. Um, both care, care standards and making future treatments available um, as soon as possible. So while current clinical trials do not include pediatri pediatrics, um, I would say that the children are not forgotten and they're a huge, huge part of the conversation in the field right now. So that's kind of where things stand. It's a good answer. I should have um, punched you here was... right away. I should have said, Anna, why don't you tell me about that? <laughs> I emailed some people that are part of this group and one of them had a question on family planning. I'm not really yeah. sure how that's differentiated versus what we've discussed, but can you- Yeah, it's all kind of wrapped in there. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. What was the question? To the extent that it is, like I'm not clear on the definition, but to the extent it is um, an extension of what we've already discussed, can you go into the extension aspects? Oh, so I misunderstood. So the, the, what, the question the person asked, what was the question the person asked? They were just asking, um, saying that family planning specifically was a topic of interest. I know some people tend to kind of distinguish that versus. Oh, oh, OK. So so what I've covered is, um, is fam I guess the term family planning sometimes is uh, used more broadly to include like birth control and planning for the number of children one wants to have. Um, here, I am using it to refer specifically for individuals with FSHD and planning to like planning our family or sometimes they say family building options or reproductive options. Um, so I, you, and a lot of folks um, use those terms synonymously. And then, we try to, I think, get away from the term reproductive option because, um, I don't know, it can sound more technical and also, I don't know, excludes the non, the less like high tech options, but any case. Family building, family planning, reproductive options, all referring to the same thing. It looks like we just had some bouts join as well. We're taking questions either if you want to um, come on the mic or through the chat if you prefer as well. We've got a few minutes left here. So, um, and I'm going to share my screen one more time just so I can get to my last slide, which has some resources and contact information. Oh, man, I thought I did it right this time. I didn't. Ah, ha, ha. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So here's my email address, website to our center. And also I put here the website for the National Society of Genetic Counselors. Um, if I find a genetic counselor. Um, and um, you, genetic counselors are hard to come by. There may not be um, it, like in your state, depending on where you live. Um, but there's also telehealth uh, genetic counseling. One question on that, just or your, mm -hmm. um, is there much of a benefit to being in person for that? Like, is there any additional? Mm -hmm. No, yeah. I, before before COVID, I was like, I, no way, I can do my job and like connect with individuals um, by Zoom. But um, I was wrong, and I uh, it's great. It's it's, it's so good. it's just increasing access because um, in Baltimore we have you know seventy five genetic counselors, but in Oklahoma there may be like. I don't know, 75 total, no offense to Oklahoma. But my point is that access um, varies widely across the country and also access to experts, right? So um, 
I get questions from genetic counselors, like, can you help me with FSHD? Like, I am a genetic counselor. I learned about this a little bit, but I don't understand the nuances. Um, can you help me? So I do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer that way. So um, it's probably better to have a consult. It is better to have a consultation with a if you, genetic counselor either who knows about FSHD, if, if your questions are specific to that, or a genetic counselor who's familiar with whatever option you're considering. Um, and if that's by telehealth, fantastic. And then we had one question come through the chat. I think you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, if it is passed on, if you've got a child mm -hmm. that's diagnosed, um, is there any expectation you can have whether the symptoms may be better, worse, et cetera? No, there's not. Unfortunately, we can't um, we can't predict the level of symptoms or the age of onset based on a genetic test result or really based on the family history as well. Um, and that's, that's challenging. You know, I talk to, to, um, to individuals who say, look, I, I do it all right. Like this affects me, yes, but look at me. I've had a happy life, successful life. I've, I've overcome or I'm dealing with it. Like if my child was gonna be like me, like I'm okay with that. But what I'm really concerned about is having a child who's more severely affected. And, you know, we just can't predict that. So that's a factor that goes in. Um, it is an area of research uh, trying to understand that variability and why why the same size deletion may result in different levels of symptoms. But at this point, it's not um, anywhere close to where we can make those predictions um, clinically in practice. Well, you mentioned there at the end was what I was going to follow up with. So from my understanding, it is the same size deletion. Some people seem to have implied that it may vary. Uh, say that again. The deletion size it is consistent when it's passed on. Oh yeah. Okay. So the, thank you. Uh, the the deletion itself does not change size. Um, but the uh yeah. So if your parent has who's affected has you know eight repeats, then your if you inherit it would have eight repeats. So that it doesn't like expand or change when transmitted across generations. All right. Any last questions? Okay. Well, Julie, thanks again for joining us today and sharing all this information. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a good night, everybody.